um, the, the pattern is very consistent. Um, one thing I should say, just going back to the ministers, I, I should mention that the ministerial positions used to be kind of more, I don't know, they call them soft positions, but Minister of Education, Minister of Culture, Minister of Youth, Sports, Community Development, that sort of thing. Now women are taking on many more of the core ministerial positions, um, finance, trade, uh, defense, Anyway, the, 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 the justice in this case. Um, so some of these poor ministerial positions are now being claimed by women, and again, it's, it's a pattern that you see in the post-conflict countries. Okay, in addition to the legislative changes, you also see constitutional changes. Um, and here we have, um, uh, if, you, if you compare, this is a very rough way of doing this, but if you compare the gender-related provisions in African constitutions, um, again, the post-conflict countries come out with um, higher rates of representation. The Equality Clause you find pretty much in all constitutions these days. But if you look at um, an anti-discrimination clause, you, you have higher rates for um, post-conflict labor. Um, the quota issue I just mentioned, um, higher, three times more countries post-conflict mention this. Um, one of the most important changes that you're seeing in African constitutions is the provision of, um, that deals with customary law. Um, in most constitutions, there's a provision that says that customary law and traditional authorities are to be respected, that are to be, are to be honored, but if there is a conflict between customary law and statutory law or the constitution, the constitution overrides customary law. And this is an important innovation in African constitutions, but it's something that you see again, primarily in these post-conflict constitutions. Um, you have positive measures with a state, and this is perhaps promising the sky, and you know, these are not always not delivered on, but, but saying that, that the state is responsible for um, ensuring that women are in politics, that women are, have education, that women have health, and so on. So you can see those kinds of um, clauses. Um, another issue that came, that was particular to the um, conflict countries was the issue of violence against women because women suffered so horribly during conflict, um, as did men. Um, but this also became a, a key rallying point for uh, women's rights activists to get these clauses into the Constitution. Um, land and property rights, uh, because of upheaval, women often got pushed off their, their, their land. And um, if you look, for example, at northern Uganda today, it's still the people who have, the lead, who have, the, who have been the most um, disenfranchised from the land are the widows um, who didn't have access to men to be able to access their land. And so, um, you know, the war disrupts property relations and this becomes a key, really, really central issue for women, um, especially in societies that are, where you require, where you need to have access to land to be able to cultivate, to be able to eat, to be able to feed your, your family. Um, another issue that's become really, uh, another big, big one that's being discussed a lot in Africa, and I've been working now in, in Morocco and North Africa, and the citizenship issue has become a big one. If, um, can the citizenship of children be passed down through the mother, um, not just the father? And then there again, you see more, um, more constitutions that are um, post-conflict. The reason why you can then measure this, and, and overall, you should have this kind of a comparison where 63% of the post-conflict countries have these gender-related provisions versus 37%. The reason you can make this, 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 this is not comparing apples and oranges. All these countries have been passing, making these constitutional reforms, revising their constitutions um, at the same time. So this is not, um, this is not only happening in the post-conflict constitutions. The only constitutions that have not been re revised are the Tanzanian, the Botswana, and um, right now Liberia is in the process of uh, revising its constitution, and Liberia is a post-conflict country, the other two aren't. Um, but by and large, most countries have, and during the same time period, have been making these, these changes. Um, legislative changes. Um, if you look at the issues of land, I mentioned how important these are to women. Here again, you see the, the majority of the countries that have made changes in land laws that affect women, um, that have addressed women's concerns, have been the post-conflict countries. Violence against women, um, another area where if you do the beam counting and, and actually, you know, again, it doesn't look at the content of the, these laws, but just you get a rough idea that there's been twice as much legislation passed um, around gender-based violence 
in the post-conflict countries. And again, this is because these countries have been so affected, and this has become a, a rally cry for uh, women's rights activists. There's also a lot of emphasis by donors on this issue. Um, perhaps many have argued that there's been an overemphasis because um, to the detriment of other issues. So what's going on here? <laughs> you know, how do we explain this? Um, well, first we need to just to, to give some background. There's been several things that have happened here that, um, that allowed for, the, for these kind of structural changes that allowed for this, this, these patterns to emerge. One was the overall decline of conflict, which is hard to, to think about sometimes when you, you know, open the newspaper and you're looking at the, at, you know, what the, the latest that Daesh or ISIS has done in the conflict in Syria. But if you look at the overall global patterns, um, there's been a market change. If you look at this section with the, this part here, if you look at the overall trajectory, it's been downward. Um, there's been some recent upward in, in recent years, but overall you can see that it's a very dramatic uh, change, and it's primarily in the civil wars. These are civil wars where you see this, this downward movement, and this is a global phenomenon. But um, the reason why we're talking about Africa <laughs> primarily is because Africa accounts for so many of these conflicts and has, has been the scene of so much of this warfare. And you see the same pattern happening in Africa um, after the 1990s, um, where you, the civil wars is where you see the, 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 the downward slope, um, the end of the independence wars, um, and you know, this, this international wars not being so important to, that, to the story here. So the end of conflict is, is critical here, and, and uh, this is a bit of a detour, but you know, what are some of the reasons? Um, very briefly, it has to do with the fact that there's been more emphasis on peace negotiations. Um, there's been, there have been many more international and regional peacemaking missions. Um, if you look at, um, compare the, the numbers of peacemaking missions by the United Nations or, or uh, ECOWAS in West Africa, um, there's many, many more there were many, many more after the 90s compared to the, the 80s and 70s. So, I mean, just dramatically more. So that, that helped. Um, there was uh, more peace diplomacy. So whenever there was an outbreak in conflict, like when there was the election violence in Kenya, um, Kofi Annan in, jumped in. This was in 2008. He jumped, he got involved. Um, leader, many different African leaders get, are, are, you know, get involved fairly quickly to try to um, how do you say it, tone it down to, to, to bring the situation under control. So much more international and African attention to these conflicts. Um, there's also was, you know, Libya began to play, Gaddafi began to play nice after 2006, um, so there was much less interference. Libya had been involved in almost every conflict in Africa, so that, that then changed after 2006. And then the big, the story that you don't hear about as much, and, I, and this is something that I discuss in the book quite a bit, is the role of the peace movements, because they were really critical to um, bringing an end to the war. If you, I don't know if any, any of you have seen the video, um, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. Have any of you seen that? You have to see it, yes, you have to see it. I mean, you, see, you see very powerfully how women were involved in, this, in the peace movement that brought an end to the conflict. And, and doing interviews in Liberia, uh, you know, I basically asked people, was this, is this true, did this happen? And yeah, pretty much across the board, regardless of what political side you took, um, the story was stuck. And I talked to people who were in the peace negotiations, um, lots of them, and they, they said that it really, if it hadn't been for the women, the war just could have dragged and dragged on forever. So <clears throat> this is the untold story. It's the story you don't hear in the New York Times, it's a, it's, it's, but it's a definitely an important part of peace. Um, this, this downward trajectory that I'm describing, and it's one that really heavily involves women. So we had then um, what I call opportunity structures that presented themselves then at the end of conflict, which then allowed for women to enter in to make demands for these changes that I've been describing. So we talked about the constitutions. You had the constitutions being rewritten. Um, you had um, peace negotiations and agreements that also allowed women to make demands. You had electoral commissions that were formed, and women often were heading up these electoral commissions that then um, set new rules for how elections should be held. And you had truth and reconciliation commissions, which I won't talk about, but these were, these were also opportunities to, to air the grievances of what had happened during the, the years of conflict and bring to the fore what, what suffering men and women had gone through. 
So if you look for in the area of constitutional reforms, um, you had women were very active in, in many countries. Uh, in Uganda, for example, you had people like Miriam Atembe and Miriam Atum who sat on the Constitutional um, Commission that drafted the, the Constitution. And Uganda's Constitution has, I think, like 23 different provisions around women. It's very, very extensive, and it was one of the first to have these very extensive provisions around women's rights. Um, women were also involved in the Constituent Assembly, which then met and deliber deliberated on the um, Constitution. And if you t I've talked to the people who were on the Constitutional Commission, and as well as people who were in the, and I actually sat in on the proceed some of the proceedings of the Assembly. Uh, women were very, very active in these. They were, were and the, also the leadership of the Constitutional Commission. Um, John Maligo, who, who headed up the commission, was very supportive of women's rights. Um, he was put there for that reason. <laughs> Um, or one of the reasons, anyway. Um, but um, but it didn't it didn't just happen on its own. You had actors who were pushing for these changes, um, and in particular issues having to do with representation, land rights, you know, all the things that we've been talking about. Um, and in, and it, and it didn't just happen, you know, kind of overnight either, or it, or without some. You know, there was a real there were real struggles that took place, even when you had supportive um, leaders like like Father John Maligo, who was heading up the commission. You had, um, for example, at one point in the Constitutional um, Constituent Assembly, there was some guy that was making fun of the women that, who, were, who were there. There were 30% of the participants were women, or, the, or maybe over 30%. And he was like, oh, you women, you think you, you know everything, but you're just like little frogs who peek your head over the cup of a coffee, and you think you've seen the world. At that point, the women just all left the, <laughs> the assembly, and they you know, walked out. Um, and they said they weren't coming back until they got an apology. Um, but that set the tone for the rest of the Constituent Assembly, and there was none of that kind of nonsense after that. I mean, it was like, um, you know, they, they, the men had to, had to respect the women. Um, so having the women there forced a change in the, you know, kind of the culture of, the, of this kind of assembly, forced a change in the way that the people interacted. Um, in Liberia, I interviewed Gloria Scott, who had been the head of the Supreme Court at one point, but she's now the, this is the one, one of the three countries that hasn't had a new constitution, but she's now um, very active in that review um, committee in Liberia, and is also pushing for women's rights provisions within the constitution. Um, they had a bit of a hiatus because of, the, as you know, the Ebola um, crisis there has put things on hold, but they're, you know, they're, they're returning to that now. Um, but you had now women who are in these kind of key positions who are able to influence outcomes. In peace agreements, 32% um, of the peace agreements include women's rights provisions in Africa. That's higher than any other part of the world. And the most important agreement is the comprehensive peace agreement that ends the conflict. And 62% of those um, CPAs include um, this kind of language incorporating women's rights in African constitutions. Um, and that's, um, you know, the big problem with the peace agreements is always that women are not included in the, in the, in the actual talks themselves. <coughs> they, on average, it's about 9% of the, the seats are held by women in, in peace talks. Um, that's just outrageous when you think of, you know, how, what they go through during war and the fact that women activists are generally some of the most adamant, strongest advocates for peace in a society. Um, it's just totally unacceptable. That continues with the Syrian talks. It continues with the Libyan talks. So these are you know, issues that continue. But um, you know, getting women to the table is still an issue. But nevertheless, having said that, um, this language is being incorporated into these peace agreements, and it is women's rights activists that are helping do that. Okay, now we have to get to the part of explaining all of this. So, you know, so what accounts for all these changes? Uh, well, I think that it has to do with these disruptions that take place in gender roles, but also in the gender regime. If you look at uh, what happened in um, Uganda, for example, I've been following Uganda for a long time. I've been, I started there in 19, I first went there in 1968. Um, I grew up in Tanzania, so we went there on a safari, 68. But that doesn't count because that, I was, that was not for research. I was only a kid then. Um, but. I started my research there in 92, and I've been going back pretty much every year, not every, not every year, but, but, but close to that. So I've been able to watch this society uh, change. And when I first went there, women you know, didn't, they, they, had, they did some things, um, but, um, but not on the scale that you see today. Um, and what had happened during the war was that women, would ne women never used to drive cars, 
They were all of a sudden driving cars. They were heading up their households. They were taking on new roles like carpentry or brick making, new things, new roles that women just never did. It wasn't part of the definition of you know, being a female. Um, you saw um, um, some major disruptions that took place in, in, what, in people's sensibilities. Um, uh, women in business. Um, now you have these business, women in business awards. Lots of women getting into not just small businesses but big businesses. Um, there's a this woman. Just to give you one example, I think could give many. In the book, I, I give many examples of. This is Alice um, Kalugaba, who just won the last Women in Business Award. Um, she started out um, making breakfast rolls and employed a few bicycle delivery men. Um, then she got a grocery store. Then she got some back, back loans and business training and then grew it into this Nina Enterprises, which is one of the largest um, home furnishing businesses in downtown Kampala. And that's just you know, one person, obviously. But you know, it gives you a picture of, of, of the kind of the dra dramatic nature of the change that one sees in, in Uganda in a fairly short period of time. Uh, women activists pushed for a 1.5 affirmative action program. And so in the beginning, you had very few women at the university level. Um, and as a result of this um, affirmative action program, now the very best students that graduate are women um, because they got a little bit of a leg up in the, when they started out. Um, you've also seen dramatic changes in the number of um, the ratio of girls to boys in primary school that went from 79% in 1985 to 102% in 2011, so more girls than boys in school now. Um, and at the tertiary level, at the, at the university level, this number tripled numbers of, of, of women that are in, in universities. Um, it also, I think some of the, one of the biggest changes is kind of intangible. You can't, you can, you can feel it, but you can't really, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, sense, a sense that one gets. That is that from just talking to women, the sky is the limit. I mean, people, women very often talk about, you know, I, well, now because women can be in, the, in parliament, they can be in, they can be vice president. We had, we had the vice president for 10 years that was a woman. Women can be top ministerial positions um, in agriculture, in defense, and in finance. They can do anything. Um, so when I first went to Uganda, there was only one woman, a um, race car driver. Now if you look at the newspaper, there's just dozens of them. You know, everybody's a race car driver. Or women are mechanics. Or the whole sports scene has completely transformed itself. Women are into you know, netball, volleyball, soccer, everything, football, they call it. Everything. I mean, it's, it, there's a whole movement around women in sports that you just never saw before. Um, a friend of mine who helped, who, who um, worked on that, one of my books with me, um, she decided at the end of that book to be, run for a vice chancellor of a university, you know. And she, well, you know, she became, she's been doing that ever since. I think, um, it's been now, you know, over 10 years she's been vice, vice chancellor of the university. And that's just not uncommon. And it's not just women who think this, I mean, men also, they, they, whenever they, you know, have a discussion at the university about some position or some job, they always, there's always that question, do we consider the women, are there, are there enough women on this committee, are there enough women um, participating, have we been fair to the women? So this is something that's really seeped into the culture and, and is quite widespread in a way that you just never would have seen um, in the, right after the war. Um, so change, the changes at the, in, the, in gender relations are, are very palpable and, and a part of the story. But another key piece um, is the expansion of women's movements. And this happened during the war through the peace movements, but the peace movements morphed very quickly into demands for political power because women realized that they just, that you weren't going to get anywhere unless you had power. You had to be at the table. You couldn't just be um, fighting from the outside saying, we want this, we want that. You have to be at the table. And so that became a really important demand. At the table in the peace talks, at, you know, in the constituent, in the constituent assembly, um, in the parliament, in the local councils. Um, and so in, in Liberia, for example, one of the, the, I asked this question over and over again, what happened, what changed during the war? And you know, woman after woman would say, you know, in the, in, the, in the past, women were in the back, now, and men were in the front. Now, women are in the front. <laughs> And men are, well, who knows? <laughs> but at least women are now speaking. They say women never spoke in, in public meetings. They always would sit there quietly. Now women are speaking, men are speaking. Um, but women are very much a part of the, the debate and the, and the conversation about the, the future of their communities. And that was something that just was unheard of in the past at that level. Um, you had some, you had women, elite women, who were in, in positions of power, but not at the grassroots like you see now. Um, 
so the, the women's movements. And then you had this, in the background, the changes in international norms, which affected all countries. It wasn't just the post-conflict countries. And here you had, um, but I think that the countries that were, had gone through conflict were more permeable. They were more open to these international influences, um, partly because they were more in need of donor funds. And that along with the donor funds came pressure to change, um, you know, they, they were supporting the women's activists who were changing laws, who were changing the Constitution. Um, and so, and these norms became especially visible after 1995. And 1995 is the year that we had this um, UN conference on women in Beijing, which was a really important conference in terms of setting the agenda, the international agenda for women's rights. Um, it, this is the conference where Hillary Clinton said, you know, women's <coughs> rights are human rights, and human rights are women's rights. This was the conference that, that adopted a platform of action that said that women have to be in part of all uh, positions of power um, in, in government, in NGOs, in religious institutions, women have to, states have to take steps to ensure that women are in power. Um, you also had the same thing happening at the, at the regional level. So the Southern African Development Community, which is a trade group of 14 member states in Southern and Eastern Africa, uh, also put um, pressure for quotas, for legislation around violence against women, for some, many of the things that we saw. Um, so these were all part of the story, part of, part of what explained what happened. Um, but what accounts for these trends and what the most important difference, because one has to still account, you know, you had women's movements in you know, lots of African countries, you had um, international norms affecting lots of African countries, but it's really this first piece here, this disruption in gender relations, this kind of a, uh, upheaval in society that forced uh, new players onto the table, new play, forced forced women into to participate in new ways that really distinguishes the post-conflict countries from the others. But now if you don't have these other factors, for example in Angola, you have almost no independent women's movement. You have a few women's organizations, but if you, if you just ask a few questions, you find out very quickly, they're all tied to the ruling party. There's no independent movement, and there was no real independent pressure um, from uh, the women's movement, partly because the country's been remained so authoritarian, um, partly because of the stranglehold of the ruling party, um, partly because um, um, of the influence of, they've had you know, enormous amounts of oil wealth that they've, and diamonds that they've been able to use to, to squelch any kind of opposition, um, and so, uh, and then buy off and threaten anybody who resisted the system. Um, so it's not even always such so much of an overt repression, although even that's, you know, those they just jailed one of the, the the most outspoken rappers recently, even that continues, but most of it's been by preventing people who resist the regime in some way from getting passport, they can't travel for it, they can't get jobs, they can't go to university, they, they just cut off all their avenues for advancing themselves, making life impossible for them. So you have to have some political space um, that allows for these, for women's movements to, um, to, to emerge. And where you haven't had that, um, Angola, Eritrea, Chad, you haven't seen really like this kind of change. Um, and then you have to have these, these um, changes in international norms um, that, that then influence the kind of do donor funding, for example, that um, al allow for domestic actors to be able to use international treaties to put pressure for change um, internally. Uh, I think I'll skip that. So this, this then, what does a study mean for other, um, this, this study in a way raised more questions for me than it answered. Um, and I'll just throw out a few of them. The, the, the last chapter, if you're looking for a good dissertation topic, the last chapter's got a lot of ideas for, for, for how one might you know, go, go ahead with some of these um, the issues that are raised in this book. So one question is, if conflict disrupts gender relations, does it also disrupt other social relations? Um, the one movement where I saw this most clearly was with the um, disability movement, um, which was a spin-off very often, not always, but very often it was a spin-off of the women's movement. Um, and that is because women who were disabled, and, and in you know, some countries there were lots of them, um, were much more prone to being raped, they had a much harder time engaging in agriculture, um, and they had to sustain the families and so on. Um, and so it became a really important issue um, for the disability movement became an important, um, kind of a, yeah, another, another important movement. Um, and so in a country like Uganda, they also got a Minister of State for Disability. They got reserved seats also for people who were disabled 
Um, but what about you know LGBT issues, for example? I mean, they became very prominent in a country like Angola, in, in South Africa, Namibia. Um, the movements became very active. Um, and then they also, in like Uganda, there was a lot of repression and also of, of the movements. Um, that, that's a question that's an open one for me. I'm not sure I can even answer it, but I, one does see some, some correlation there. That's, so that's one question. Another one, and there, one could ask the same question about youth, about um, other um, marginalized groups as well. Um, did they benefit in the same way? Um, another question that I had is, that, well, with, while women's, group, women's roles expanded after conflict and women were better positioned to demand further rights, it's less clear what happened to men. Um, did men also take on new roles? Did they start doing more care work as women took on new roles outside the home? Did women continue to remain subordinate to women in the household even when their roles expanded in other areas? Um, certainly, the subordination didn't disappear overnight um, and, and you know, it may take generations. Um, but if you look at this as a, as a process, um, certainly the expansion of women's, the, uh, the expansion of female roles was the first step in this direction. But the more troubling piece of this for me really was what happened to the men. And for them, you know, much like after World War I, you know, if you look at the descriptions of men after World War I, you know, they talk about them as being a shell of their former selves and who had survived the war. Um, this is also what I saw in Uganda. In some parts of Uganda, when I was doing interviews, I could hardly find a man that wasn't um, drunk. <laughs> um, Northern Uganda, which had gone through this 20-year conflict, I did work up there. And I, you know, I had to work through the local authorities, who were often men, and they were not they were not capable of speaking to me, and so, and yet I had to get their permission to talk to people, um, and, and it was because they were just out of it, and um, and so they were not perhaps as resilient as women. Um, this is not just my opinion. There's also been studies done by psychologists and others who looked at the same issue and have come to similar conclusions in com in countries like or like part like northern. Northern um, Uganda after 2006, um, and so how do you then, you know, it, okay, so women then advance themselves, but men have a much harder time, um, and they 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 suffered horribly. We, I've talked to men who you know who endured the the war in Liberia. The options were really really limited, especially for young men. Either they were caught by the militia and forced to fight as child often as child soldiers. Or they were they had to escape into the bush and, and spend the whole time trying to hide, or they had to stay in at home and hide in their homes, or they or if they were lucky they could get um, money and flee the country and go to Ghana or the U.S. or somewhere else. But for men, I mean, their options were much much more limited than for women, and so um, you know the question I guess is um, how do we think of these negative byproducts of war um, and and. and negative byproducts of major social disruptions, are they inevitable or can they be ameliorated by greater attentiveness to these consequences, um, of which really there hasn't been enough attention paid to? Um, another question I have is the changing nature of conflict in Africa. I mean, now we see different kinds of, we don't see these kinds of long 30-year conflicts that we, well, maybe we will, but we don't, we, the, the, the kinds of conflicts that we, I was describing that um, don't exist today in, in the same way. Um, and, and much more, you're much more likely to see um, election violence, and you're more likely to see um, terrorist groups. So the rise of Boko Haram, for example, which is one of the biggest menaces in Africa right now, and is much worse than Daesh in terms of the numbers of people they were killing, um, or the continuation of Al Shabaab in Somalia, or Ansar Din in Mali, or um, the Akim, the, the Al Qaeda version of, of in, in the Algeria and Mali, and so on. These are these Islamic. Some of these are Islamic groups um, that are influenced by Salafism um, and other conservative ideologies, and they pose new challenges, and they often target women in particular. Um, and they, and so you know, what do we make of them? And does all of these things that I've just talked about do they apply um, in these cases as well? These are unanswered questions. But I will stop there and entertain questions. So thank you very much.